Hello and welcome to my floss tube channel. I'm Jean Farish and today we're going to talk about a wide range of things, all of which have been inspired by some excellent questions that I've gotten in the last couple of weeks. We're going to start with one from Sue and her question caused me to dig a little bit deeper into the subject matter. So this is what Sue wrote. She said, I have trouble stitching in hand with floppy fabric. I end up using a five inch hoop when that happens. I have small hands and wonder if that's the problem. What do you do with the excess fabric that's hanging? So the first thing I told Sue and that I will tell you is that you need to stitch in the way that you are the most comfortable. Obviously here, I stitch in hand. That's my go-to method. I do make some exceptions and we'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But by and large, I stitch in hand 99.9% .9 of the time. But that's what works for me. It doesn't necessarily mean it's what will work for you. So the other thing that I, that I didn't mention to Sue is I, I would say that I have fairly small hands too. I, I am all of five foot one and fairly small boned. And so I would say that I have small hands also. Now, in stitching something like, say, the Roxy Sampler, this is on fabric that's 20 by 24. Not a humongous piece, certainly not as big as the piece that I use when stitching uh, America Land that we love. But in both of these cases, I did stitch in hand. So Sue's question made me ask myself, well, exactly how do I manage that? Because I really don't address that at all. So let's say, for example, if the next thing I'm doing is to stitch the strawberry that's going to be right here. So, and, and this is kind of hard to show on camera. Let me set up my other camera and see if that will make it a little bit easier. So I've placed a, a needle here to indicate kind of my target area. This is where I'm going to stitch next. What I want to do is to get my excess fabric out of the way. So I'm going to fold a lot of it over just on the diagonal and then just start rolling it until I get over to the area where I'm going to be stitching. And now I, I can comfortably hold this. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's soft and it's not creating any stress on my non-dominant hand. And yet I'm free to stitch right in the, in the area where I want to focus on. And so that, that's how I do it. I, I don't, I don't know how, how others manage, but I don't use any clips or anything like that when once I've gotten the excess fabric rolled up and I just keep it kind of soft. The other thing that I do is I am very willing to turn my whole project upside down, turn my chart upside down and work in that regard if that makes it easier to get to the area where where I need to stitch. The biggest challenge I think is when the stitching is in the middle and there's no doubt about it that that's that's the hardest area I think. Maybe the edges are harder as far as I had all that fabric to roll up but in the middle I've got kind of what Sue was talking about the floppy fabric. So if I'm stitching in the center like when I next have to stitch this area right here then I do the same thing as far as getting the fabric out of the way um, on one side but on the other side I do have all this fabric and and I just let it flop. And it does mean that if I'm poking and pulling, then I'm doing a lot of coming back and forth like this, which is probably not the most gracious looking um, way to stitch, but it works for me. I would also say that stitching in hand probably works best when you do the sewing method as much as possible. Now, when you do the sewing method, you're basically inserting your needle to finish a stitch and bringing it to the front of the fabric where the next stitch is going to begin. So Sue's question made me then look at the whole question of how do we stitch, not just handling the fabric, but how, what's our setup like? Where do we stitch? 
what's our body position and what are we stitching with or on. So I made just a quick list of ways I think most people stitch and I, I, I probably will leave something out and I'll apologize ahead of time that that's probably gonna happen. So these are what I think are the main things. Stitching in hand where you don't have any kind of apparatus at all. Stretcher bars, embroidery hoops, cue snaps, scroll frames, slate frames. So I think that they're kind of the main kind of, again, the apparatus or the, the tools with which we may stretch our fabric for stitching. And then the next thing is, are you holding this apparatus in hand are you holding on to your cue snap or your embroidery hoop or your scroll frame with one hand as you stitch with the other or do you have that attached to something so that both hands are free um, whether or not you stitch two-handed or not is 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 a whole different part so see i mean when you start thinking about how we stitch it's there's like these little ripple effect of you've got this decision and that leads to another decision leads to another decision. And what works for one person is not necessarily going to work for another person. So you need to find the way that's the most comfortable for you. So as far as what you attach this thing to, there are table frames or stands, there are lap frames, there are floor stands. So again, you can hold that embroidery hoop in your hand or you can attach it to something um, so that you don't have to hold it. Um, for myself, what I have discovered is that if I am stitching kind of in this position at a table, I can stitch for maybe an hour and that's stretching it. After an hour, the back of my neck hurts, my shoulders hurt, I am tired of stitching. The way I stitch, other than when I'm making these videos, is in a recliner, um, just not really terribly reclined, my feet definitely up. And in that position, I can stitch for hours. I mean, I have stitched for eight or 10 hours other than getting up to stretch every once in a while, getting something to eat or drink. And, and, I'm, and I'm not tired. I, I am not tired at all. There's no muscle fatigue anywhere in my body. So over the years, I have found that that's my most comfortable way to stitch. I also sometimes um, sit on our couch in the living room to be with family, to watch TV or whatever. I make sure I have a lumbar pillow that I put um, in the small of my back and my and again my feet are up on an ottoman or whatever and I find again in that position that I can sit for quite a long time without having any kind of muscle fatigue. I've never succeeded in finding a comfortable position sitting sitting up like this at a table. So again that is what I have learned works for me and what doesn't work for me. And I would encourage each stitcher to kind of explore the, the possibilities and find what works for you. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is how portable do you want your work to be? Um, and this is why some stitchers have several projects going at a time. They might have one um, serious massive project that they have mounted on scroll frames and they have it on a floor stand and they have their stitching nest at home and all their tools are right there handy and then they might have a smaller project an ornament or a pin keep or something of that nature that can just they could toss in their purse or their tote bag and and have it on the go so that's that's a possibility also. In planning this segment, my first thought was, I wish I had one of each one of these things so I could show you how to mount the fabric, how to hold it, talk about the pros and cons of each one. But I don't have all of these things here at home. However, I do have what some people consider a sit-upon hoop. So let me show you this. 
Um, this has a fairly large um, hoop. I think this is a 10 inch that I have mounted here. This particular one comes with like three different size hoops and they have to be the hoops that come with this. They're not, they're not universal. And so what I do is I literally slide that part under my body. I figure out how I need to, where it needs to be to, to be comfortable. And then I can sit back and stitch. This model also works as a table stand because it's adjustable. The height is adjustable this way. Um, and if you, you can actually even cantilever it. You can put a weight on here. Um, a, a book will work. I mean, anything heavy, if, if, that, if that helps. And so it's fairly adjustable. Um, and again, when, when I do need a hoop, this is the model I go to. So the bottom line is that there is no one way to stitch. There's no one position. There's no one tool. There's, um, it just all depends on what works best for you. And I would encourage you to just try different things until you figure out what, what works best for you. One of the themes that you are aware of if you've been watching any number of my episodes is that I wash and iron all of my traditional cross stitch. There are exceptions. I'm working on a gold work project and that will not get washed. But my traditional cross stitch, it all gets washed and ironed. And not only do I wash and iron it when I'm finished before I am mounting it for framing, but I often wash and iron projects while I'm working on them. America Land That We Love is one example because I worked on it over the span of over four years. About every six months or so, I did stop and wash and iron it just to freshen it up. I also feel like that if you're working on something over a long period of time, that if you're not careful, whatever dirt that is on the project will actually get um, kind of embedded in the, in the fibers. And I don't want that to happen. Um, and the other reason that I often wash and iron things while they're still a work in progress is if I need to do a photography shoot. So when I say I wash and iron every project, I it, very often it's more than one time. So with that said, last week when I talked about the need to um, make sure that your over dyed flosses are color fast and what we can do to make them color fast. Then that brought up the whole thing of why bother if you're not going to wash and iron it, then it doesn't matter whether the threads that you're stitching with are color fast or not. And that prompted a post on Facebook which I'll share with you right now. So looking at this picture, what you are seeing, um, and I'll kind of focus in on the, the area, in the bottom part of this letter C, can you see it looks like a black smudge? Well, Maria sent me this picture and she said that this is what happened when she had a Band-Aid on her, on her finger, washed her hands, and you know how the Band-Aid just seems to soak up water. And then she sat down to stitch, not realizing that there was still some dampness in that Band-Aid. So here's a case of somebody who had no intention of washing and ironing this piece. And because of sitting down with a damp Band-Aid on her hand, this is what happened. So this is just a case in point of what I was saying last week, that even if you don't intend to wash and iron your piece, life happens. And so making sure that your over dyed flosses are color fast is an important preventive step to take. And reflecting on what we were just talking about with the different things that we can use to hold our fabric. I wonder how people who use embroidery hoops get the embroidery hoop creases out of their fabric without steam or without spritzing the fabric or whatever. 
So don't kid yourself, even if you're not washing that piece, if you're getting it damp to get the creases out, you might as well wash it. My overdyed floss experiment also led to this question from Dina. She said, Jean, are you suggesting the washing of all overdyed threads, no matter the color? And my answer was, good question. My plan is to pre-wash all the dark ones. And then after I posted that comment or response, I thought, I really need to add this. I would, I would pre-wash the medium colors as well and probably keep coming down the, the color intensity until I didn't have any problems at all. So the very light colors might not need any pre-washing at all. But I'd rather be safe than sorry. And so I just don't think that the effort is going to be so great that it will not be worth it in the long run. Last week, my experiment focused on pre-washing over-dyed flosses. But the same thing can be done with even a solid color floss from a major manufacturer. If you are in doubt that the color could possibly bleed, then yes, I would recommend pre-washing it. And so I got this question from Nancy. She said, Jean, I normally do kits and use DMC floss for patterns. My question is, if you wash the floss, it must take away the intensity of the color you pick or need. I know most of the older kits would have floss. They would tell you to wash certain colors. Well, here's the thing. First of all, that whole thing about pre-washing over dyes, that can be applied to, to solid colors from major manufacturers. So if you have had experience with a DMC color bleeding or any brand fabric bleeding, and you want to take a preventive step, then yes, do the exact same thing. But here's the thing that happens with, when color bleeds, which is the color dissipating when it's wet, or crocking, which is when it rubs off when it's dry, it's not so much that you are seeping color away from the skein, as it is, you are getting rid of all these little mm, sort of like alien bits of color that have no place to attach. If they were firmly attached to the skein of floss, it wouldn't bleed or crock. So basically what you're getting rid of are these unattached bits of color. And so by pre-washing it, you're like, sort of shaking it loose. Let's just think of it that way. So you're not taking color away. You're just getting rid of the ones that haven't attached themselves. So, so far I haven't seen any loss of intensity, but my next experiment with those dark blue skeins, which I hope to do next week, I think what I'll do is take a segment out that I don't do anything with it at all. So when I'm done, we can compare and see whether or not there was any loss of color. I don't think there's gonna be, but again, that's the whole idea behind a scientific approach is that you don't draw any conclusions and then you do the experiment and then you know whether or not your kind of theory was right or not. And finally, a little bit about my travel plans for this fall. I've previously announced that I'll be doing two trips with RGE Travels, the Great Parks trip um, and the Redwoods Rails and Winery trip. And both of those still have some openings. But in between the two, I'm gonna be spending about a week and a half in the Denver, Colorado area. And I'll be teaching a class at a stitching shop in Denver. And the owner and I, Christine and I, have decided that it will be the Melbourne sampler that I'm gonna be teaching. So I'll have a little bit more information about that next week, I think. Now, the Great Parks trip is one that has just a few openings um, left on it the last time I checked. And it begins in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we're going to be making a, a trip to the Attic Needleworks shop in Mesa. 
and then our journey really takes off and we go to see just some of the most amazing natural wonders that our country has to offer. One day we'll be making a 20 mile journey through Arizona's Verde Canyon by rail. And we will also take the Grand Canyon Railway to the awe-inspiring Grand Canyon. We're gonna make a visit to the Zion National Park, to Capitol Reef National Park, to Canyonlands National Park, and to the Arches National Park. This will be my first time to visit any of these national parks, and I am absolutely thrilled that I'm gonna to get to see all of these. The only thing that would make the trip even better would be if you would come along with me. If that's at all possible, then please get the information from Ray and John at RGE Travels and make plans to, to join me. That trip will end in Grand Junction, Colorado. And so I'm gonna get to spend some time with my daughter who lives in the Denver area. And as I said, go to a stitching shop in Denver and teach for Christine and her crew. And then for the Redwoods Rails and Wineries trip, I'm gonna board the California Zephyr in Denver and travel overnight to San Francisco and join the whole group there. So there's a couple people that are taking the California Zephyr on our way to San Francisco. There are people boarding in Chicago. There's someone boarding um, in Oklahoma. And then there's, I don't know, three or four of us that are boarding in, in the Denver area. Yeah. And you're thinking about doing the California Zephyr part of it. You really need to think fast because the, the places on the train are filling. And the last time I checked, time was running out to, to claim a spot. So don't delay if you're thinking about that. And then once we get to San Francisco, we'll have an overnight in San Francisco to do some sightseeing and to make another shop visit to the Needle in a Haystack in Alameda. And then it's on to the Redwood Forest Steam Train, which is a vintage narrow gauge train, which we'll take to the summit of Bear Mountain. We'll also be visiting Yosemite and another train journey. We'll take the Sugar Pine Railroad through Sierra National Forest and go to the Railtown 1897 State Historic Park in gold mining country. And finally, we get to go to Sonoma and then Napa. We'll take the Napa Valley Wine Train, which is a 36 mile route from Napa to St. Helena and back with wine tasting along the way. Both of these trips will include an optional stitch along project, um, classes, but lots and lots of casual stitch time and just lots of time just to, to get together with other stitchers while we see some amazing scenery. And by the way, both of these trips are ideal to bring a non-stitching travel buddy, whether it's a husband, a mother, daughter, cousin, best friend, whomever. Um, the whole trip will not just be about stitching. So this is the perfect opportunity to blend going on a stitching type retreat with someone that you like to travel with. So that's about it for today. I hope that as you're stitching today, you take note of your own comfort and start making whatever adjustments you need to make to find the, the position and the type of stitching that brings you the most joy. So between now and next Saturday, please stitch happy and stay safe. I'll see you then.